The sectors include electricity generation, uh, also electrification, as, as well as energy efficiency. So that means energy uh, plays a crucial role in uh, decarbonizing uh, uh, at, at, at the global scale. Um, maybe Chi, you can help me. Uh... Okay. And uh, when it comes to the energy sector, I'd like to sort of share with you some of the recent uh, observations that I have learned, which gave you a bit of a sense of where some of the argument is coming from. From the sources of energy, of course, the big thing is uh, putting in a lot of renewables and uh, carbon capture and sequestration of some of the fossil fuel generators. Uh, that's what is happening in the uh, supply side. Uh, this is a, you know, we, you must have been taking some class on forecasting or prediction, but be always, be always be very careful with the forecasting. This is the outlook of the solar installed uh, annual capacity by uh, IEA. And guess what? They have missed big time. <laughs> this is the, the forecast and this is the actual installation in 2023. So the, on the supply side, big things are happening in terms of decarbonization. On the demand side, I live in a place a beautiful state called Texas. And I'm just going to tell you something just happened in my neighborhood. Electrification is happening in big time in terms of both replacing the existing demand from non-electrical to electrical, as well as adding new kinds of electrical demand such as uh, internet data center and cryptocurrency mining. Uh, this is the peak demand of ERCOT just in the past two years. You look at this number, it's like, wow, are we in a developing nation or what, right? 2021, 75 gigawatts. 2022, 80 gigawatts. 2023, this past summer, I was on TV a lot because every time they broke a record, they had an interview of some kind of experts. So they broke like 20 times just in this past summer. 85 uh, gigawatts. So electrification is happening big time. And on both ends of supply and demand, I think there's a very big important aspect to capture the decarbonization effort, which people may have not talked so much about, but I think it's very, very important to illustrate it, is that energy efficiency. We need to do the same kinds of job with less energy. And that applies to both supply side and demand side. This again, is a very interesting uh, study of the US energy consumption. Ever since the 1970s, uh, some of you were there. Uh, you probably remember those days on uh, the oil crisis, where they put a big emphasis on energy efficiency. And you look, the projection of uh, of, of energy consumption was was way curved down. Precisely, be it's not because we did not grow. The U.S. economy has grown quite a bit. The population also has grown quite a bit. But guess what? The rate of energy use is not growing nearly as fast as what they have projected, largely thanks to energy efficiency. So to summarize, um, on the supply side, on the demand side, and on the energy efficiency side, there's a big thing that need to be done at scale, at speed, to do the decarbonization. We, as you know, I see myself as a technologist, we are uh, fortunate to be also in the era of uh, massive digitization. By digitization, I mean the proliferation of sensors, controllers, communication capabilities, and uh, hardware like power electronics. And they are digitizing both on the software side and hardware side, if you wish, that is transforming all three segments of the discussion we just had. Of course, at the end of the day, if you ask your neighbor or if you ask your mom, you say, why, why should we care? What do we really need at the end of the day when it comes to electric energy? I think you would not disagree with me that what we want at the end of the day is that we want to have affordable, equitable, clean, and resilient electric energy services, right? That's what average customer cares about. But if you stop and think about these four attributes, they are not very well aligned with each other. You want affordable, maybe they're not very resilient. You want affordable, maybe that's not very clean. Our job, our community's job, 
the uh, electric energy systems community's job is to really to harness the power of digitization, both in terms of software and hardware, and trying to hopefully bring the four attributes a little bit closer to each other. That I think is our community's job and many of you are doing fantastic work pushing that agenda uh, forward. Now, within this uh, scale of uh, discussions, what are some of the scientific challenges when it comes to the electric energy systems? So I want to kind of illustrate some of the scientific challenges in the next couple of slides. Uh, on the physics side, so electric energy system is a beautiful interplay of physics and the markets with human deeply engaged in a loop of multiple time scales. So, so on the physics side, I would like to argue that perhaps the challenge, the, the, the fundamental challenge is, is, is that we're seeing a lot more of unknown physics and unknown models that is proliferating in the grid. And then we have to deal with a lot of these high dimension, time varying intrinsic qualities as we go in terms of uh, dynamic systems speaking, right? And that is giving rise to a lot of challenges of understanding the near real-time behavior of the grid, but also in the same time, giving us a lot of opportunities to try to do the sort of state-of-the-art kind of uh, data sciences to advance the resiliency and the reliability of the grid. On the other hand, when it comes to the market, you know, we almost, you know, 80% of the US is covered in one way or the other, some form of a wholesale uh, electricity market like California, like Texas. So when it comes to the market, you know, if I were to summarize, I think the key challenges, scientifically speaking, is how do you really understand the behavior at large scale of human in the loop decision making? Not one, not two, but millions of customers behaving together. And also, how do you deal with this, uh, you know, big elephant in the room, which is the renewable intermittencies? right, through some kind of a market mechanism design and incentive designs. And when you are putting the physics and the markets together, you come up with this gigantic modeling or in the new fancy word, digital twin challenges, right? Uh, which is, I would summarize into two pieces. One is the large scale high fidelity modeling. And the other is, the flip side of all these cool things on digitization has to offer, which is the cyber physical security, all right? So I'm going to walk you through some of the work that we have been doing uh, over the years um, on each segment of the three pieces that we just talked about, on the physics side, on the market side, and on the digital twin side, okay? Let me first start from the physics. We all love renewables. California is full of solar energy. Texas is the wind energy capital of the country. Great. Um, but in place where I live, you know, we don't have to invent new problems. Just new problems are just coming to us. And I just need to sit and listen to what my ERCA colleagues are talking about. And uh, there's something very peculiar that's uh, especially happening for high penetration of renewable areas like California, like Texas. Something perhaps not many people here talk about, but I think it's very important to be mentioned about is the dynamic instabilities, right? And largely these are caused by, you know, lack of coordination of some of the advanced power electronics controllers uh, with a very wide varying operating conditions. Uh, just give you some example, there were some, uh, 550 megawatt solar plant oscillating at seven hertz in California, causing some short-term uh, operational challenges in the California ISO. There was this New England observation of 1.3 hertz of, uh, these are electromechanical dynamics that is happening on the grid all the time, right? But those which are not so well controlled or not so well maintained may have caused some uh, magnified oscillation. And that is something that power engineers don't like very much, right? We need to try to get rid of that. And then pictorically, what happened is that in a place like Texas, you have a lot of the renewables concentrated on the Panhandle area in the West. And these uh, wings are being shipped over to the data, uh, to the demand centers in Houston and Dallas and so on through long distance transmission lines. People spend billions of dollars building these, uh, what they call CRAS project, competitive renewable energy zone project, 
which is aiming to bring these gigawatt and gigawatt of wind power from West Texas to uh, the east part of the state. But because of this uh, oscillatory behavior that we are showing here, system operators have to limit how much of power they are able to deliver over these long distance, big transmission lines. To put in some analogy, not all of you are power engineers. It's like you're building an eight lane highway, but sorry, because the, the cars are just driving zigzagging, you only allow four lanes to run on the cars. Or cost it's caused by, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. It's uh, sort of a fundamentally, it's caused by some resonance uh, issues on dynamic systems. So I don't know about you, but as an engineer, when I see this, when I see gigawatts and gigawatts of transmission capability, being underutilized, you know, I, I want to solve these kind of problems, right? So, so what can we do? Thanks to the investment from places like the Department of Energy, uh, this country now, or North America now, is uh, well immersed with something called synchrophasers, uh, which has this GPS synchronized capability of uh, uh, high resolution sensing of uh, bulk high voltage transmission grids. This kind of oscillations presumably could be one of the use cases where such sensors could be utilized to number one, detect, number two, locate, and then number three, hopefully correct some of these problems, right? So thanks to the uh, partnership that we have uh, with, uh, with uh, system operators, we're able to obtain some of this uh, real world data and try to start to formulate and think about the problem. At the beginning, I thought it was kind of an easy exercise. You know, you want to find out where the biggest oscillation is and try to identify it and then try to fix that. I thought that was an easy job as, you know, as, as this data coming in. But it turns out it's a little bit harder than I thought. Uh, I'll give you an example of why it is harder. This is something actually happened near, near you. <laughs> uh, there was this incident that happened uh, in the west part of the electric grid. There was a generator up in Alberta. You guys know where Alberta is, right? Up in Canada. That is uh, creating some uh, 20 megawatts up down, 20 megawatt in power engineering terms is, it's okay, not too big. Uh, 20 megawatt of uh, power uh, swings. And for whatever reason, folks operating the California, Oregon intertie, which is a you know, thousand miles down south, was observing at that time, 10 times magnified, 10 times magnified oscillation in the form of 200 megawatt or so uh, fluctuations on that intertide, which is a very important intertide to ship the power from the north to California, right? At that time, uh, these two places are 1,000 miles apart. So it's like your intuition of something called oscillation is sort of a somehow not very well compatible with what happened. It's like if you throw a little stone into a pond, you see this ripple, and you would have assumed the source where it hit the pond would have been the highest magnitude, right? But this is somewhat counter that intuition because apparently the source is a thousand miles away from where you see the mark largest magnitude oscillation. And that is, uh, I think, answering your question about the, the mechanism. This kind of mechanism is caused by something we actually all know and we learn about in, 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 in high school physics, something called a resonance. You remember this is a discussion about the army not allowed to walk in synchrony on the bridge because uh, <laughs> there was this incident in World, War, World, War, World War I that uh, blew up one of the bridges, right? That's precisely, it turns out, mechanismally speaking, what happened, right? So now the challenge is, if you think about a large power grid as some kind of a complex dynamic system where you have multiple inputs and you have multiple observations, this observation being the synchrophasers, what would be the best way for us to number one, detect, and number two, the most importantly, locate where the problem was? Because if I can locate where the problem was, at least I can do something, right? So merely looking at the magnitude of this new advanced sensor is not enough. So we got to do something perhaps more than that. 
So that's the problem statement for this uh, for this issue that uh, we have been working with uh, ERCOT about. We kind of got stuck, you know, we, we didn't really make too much of a progress for almost two, three years, you know, just don't know what to do. Uh, and then you know, my collaborator, PR Kumar, gave me a totally different uh, source of inspiration. He's like, okay, have you thought about the computer uh, surveillance video camera in your house? I said, what? Uh, he said, oh, you know, these uh, surveillance cameras that you may have installed in your house, it's continuously, you know, taking videos, shoots, and, 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 and trying to do something, right? If there's someone coming close to your house, they will trigger some kind of alert system. So what's behind the thing is that the computers are continuously doing some kind of a so-called background and foreground separation, right? They want to separate the background and the foreground. So what, of course, they cannot do it by manual. They have to do it through computer. So what is going on in the computer? What is going on in the computer is that this uh, background, what is the mathematical term of a background? The background is something that does not change much over time, right? So that is something we call uh, low rank, right? It's a low rank. And what is a foreground? Foreground is a person walking by your house. What's the mathematical term for that? You assume that at any given time, at any given time, there are not too many people walking around your house, right? So I guess the mathematical term for that is a sparse, right? So what is happening is that the computer is trying to separate a streaming video camera into something called a low rank matrix and something called a sparse matrix. Now, you know, in its original format, this is not a very easy problem because it turns out the, the problem formulation is an MP hard problem. So computers don't have a good way to solving that. But thanks to the, a lot of the progress in the computational side, we have made great strides to actually reformulate the problem as one that is being convexified and can be solved very, very efficiently through algorithms such as uh, augmented Lagrangian multiplier based approaches. Or many of you may have heard about something called the robust PCA, a robust principal component analysis. So it's a very efficient convexified uh, algorithm that is very good at decomposing this matrix from a low rank one to the sparse one. Now, you may say, what, what in the world are we talking about? We're talking about the power system oscillation, localization. Why in the world you suddenly drop me this uh, surveillance video problem? I don't know. We just took a leap of faith because we had done some earlier work that actually suggests that for a large power grid, very complex power grid, those single phaser data actually exhibit some strangely low dimensional behavior. Even with all the noises, all the communication failure and everything, it's a very low, low rank behavior. But we kind of just thought, okay, let's try because presumably this resonance problem might be caused by the low rank part of it. So if we can remove this troublemaker, then the rest of it would still be kind of an intuition obeying. And then maybe that would give us a hint of where the problem of the source of the oscillation is. So we don't know, we just took a leap of faith, a typical data science approach, just collect this real data and we try it out. This is a problem that uh, we tried out on a, a, a large system where there are quite a few counterintuitive behavior. By counterintuitive, I mean that the source of the malfunctioning generator is far away from where you observe the highest amount of magnitude of oscillation. These are exactly the kind of problem that captures the Alberta, California behavior, right? And then to this algorithm, surprisingly, out of the 44, 43 are completely correct. And even the wrong one, if you look at this, they are electrically almost, in other words, even the wrong one is suggesting a sufficiently narrow down search space for localizing the problem. And if you're a power engineer, you would say, you know, electrically speaking, these two generators are almost identical to the grid, right? So, so then we took this to ERCOT and then we tried it out. It worked pretty well. Um, so we were very happy. We say, oh, great. I talked to the senior VP of operation. I said, Woody, 
you know, go and implement this. We can help you solve this problem in Texas. He pat on my shoulder and he looked at me. He said, you know, no, you're a good guy. I like you, but sorry, we can't do it. I said, why? He said, how can I trust this? That's a bunch of data scientists trying to play some data and then you want to convince me this is something I can do in the power grid? Sorry, no way. And that got us another two years of thinking, trying to uh, justify why it actually would work. So that would need a bit of a theoretical underpinning and model-based analysis. And again, uh, we were kind of inspired by, you know, a conversation I had with late Professor Sanjoy Mitter, where, you know, seems to know everything, every book in the world. And he gave me this very old book by Wiener on engineering cybernetics. Uh, and there was a chapter about uh, resonance. And, you know, we took some inspiration and then we found out actually it's a very easy, uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, discovery in the sense that for any dynamic, linear dynamic systems, you can always write down the response from uh, oscillation behavior into a resonance component and the resonance free component. The resonance component is the one that is giving you the trouble, right? The magnified magnitude. And turns out that that, no matter how many sensors you have, that matrix would always be at most rank two. And rank two was because you have a real part and imaginary part of this uh, corresponding mode, right? So, so that gave us a bit of a, theoretical justification of why it actually would work because we do observe in this uh, prior work that these power systems, uh, a resonance is the very low rank behavior and low rank properties. So we were able to justify that in the case of Texas. And then I'm pleased to report that this now is you know, being uh, in implemented in their operational planning team, uh, this particular technique. And then, Using this, in addition, we further have developed some corrective control mechanisms in which then whenever you have located such an oscillation, you can do some very quick feedback control through means like energy storage and batteries. And that would uh, mitigate a lot of these uh, false oscillations. And by mitigating that, you're effectively raising the transfer capability. So the, the four lane car becomes the, the eight lane car uh, road again. So effectively, you are boosting up the transfer capability to mega, gigawatts and gigawatts of power. So I think that is a, a, a very good example of, of where the, the physical dynamics lies and, and then some of the data science tools can be effectively utilized to solve some of the physical problems. And along the way, we collect a whole bunch of real data, but we are again faced with another very interesting challenge out there where, where most other domains may not have such a problem. Uh, the electric grid is under the protection of the Energy Act 2007 on CEII, Critical Energy Electric Information Infrastructure Information, right? So a lot of these things, if you take a step back and think about it, it's largely data science driven. You need to do some kind of machine learning tools. And the first thing that any kind of data science or machine learning tool would require is that it is requiring massive amount of training data. But if you talk to any power company, you say, I need a massive amount of training data on your problems, dynamics. Sorry, we can't give it to you. And Professor Sui was in that control room last week uh, where we had the luxury of having something like that, but most other places don't have that. So the question is, how can we generatively scale up a huge amount of real eventful dynamic data that is of use to the broader data science machine learning community while we are respecting the underlying physical characteristics of the grid, right? So that's another very interesting challenging out there. And uh, we're making some uh, headways along those lines and making the highways again, uh, is thanks to uh, the fact that uh, we are leveraging a, the multi-time scale as well as the differentiated level of uh, access capabilities of different kinds of model of the grid. So at the, at, the, at the very fundamental level, you can think about the power grid is driven by, you know, for, you know, just for the sake of generality, we can say there's a steady state model that is governing the 
steady state or quasi steady state behavior like the megawatts and the kilowatts that you guys talk about. Uh, and also this uh, dynamic uh, time scale, let's say just focus on the electromechanical side that is governed by a set of uh, electromechanical transient dynamics. And you have measurements on both sides. On the steady state side is covered by this power flow, which is algebraic uh, equations. And the uh, on the dynamic side is covered by a set of uh, uh, dynamic ordinary differential equations. And you have measurements of different time scales. And also you have access to the physical model of different time scales. And I would say in terms of the level of difficulty of obtaining them from the real world, perhaps the least difficult one would be those quasi steady state measurements, like the megawatts and the, the load profile and so on. The most difficult one that you can obtain for the real world is perhaps the dynamic model, right? The dynamic model, sometimes even the, the grid operators don't have a good, uh, good, good knowledge of that. So, so the question is, how do you recognize the fact that there's a, something easier, something harder, and you want to piece together them and create a generative approach is to scale up a huge amount of a, a useful dynamic data for your training purposes. So we took some inspiration from sort of the state-of-the-art uh, generative model approaches like GAN. Many of you must have uh, already used the generative adversarial networks for a lot of different purposes. But that itself will not be able to capture the underlying physical dynamic part. So how do I create a GAN that actually can follow some of the physical uh, dynamic equation that you know, people like uh, Professor Stankovic would say, oh, this looks like a real data, right? So, so we actually took a very interesting combination of combining this uh, vanilla version of the GAN with this uh, very new idea called neural ODEs, which is a way of utilizing the neural networks to mimic the behavior of a differential, ordinary differential equations. So what happened is that we obtain things that is easiest to obtain from the real world, namely the load profiles. We create a synthetic voltage data, okay? Because the, the steady state power flow model is relatively easy to obtain. So we create the synthetic voltage data that will be then used for the initial condition for the transient behavior that is governed uh, on the bottom side. And on the bottom side, we'll use the very limited real world data to be the trainer for this neural ODE. And then we'll massively scale it up so that it looks actually real for your follow-up research purposes. So at the end of the day, this is what we created. So I want you to turn on your power engineering hat. You look at the left side and right side, you probably couldn't tell much of, uh, of a difference. In other words, the right-hand side is completely made up by, by, by the AI, if you wish. But it actually, you know, I would say, oh, it looks like a generator-induced oscillation, right? I would say, oh, this is where a generator failure or something, right? So it is to the extent that it's almost realistic to a real-world problem. And we are able to demonstrate that in, uh, in the uh, Southwest Power Pool, uh, which has about uh, 1,500 nodes in the uh, Oklahoma Gas and Electric Territory. So that's another large scale study that I think is uh, of great interest to, to the community right now. We also have a lot of other ongoing projects on the physical dynamics. Uh, we are speeding up the the toughest problem in the simulation, the electromagnetic transient process through some uh, uh, FPGA and ASIC based design uh, through a DOE project with some colleagues in computer engineering. This is something where I spend a lot of time now is that we are trying to understand the low voltage right through capabilities of large flexible demand. So we have been dealing with the supply side of low voltage right through over the years, but never have we put anything on the demand side. But uh, thanks to our recent efforts, we're actually testing it out in the lab, trying to understand and create the first, uh, the, the world's first grid interconnection code for low voltage right through for large flexible demand. Uh, we're also doing something on using the so-called neural Lyapunov approach to, to obtain the uh, certified region of stability 
for network microgrids. So network microgrids are very promising solution for a lot of reasons, such as resiliencies. And uh, we're also looking at, uh, because in Texas, you know, Texas has more pickup trucks than all the other 49 states combined. <laughs> so uh, we are looking at the impact of a heavy duty vehicle. By that, I mean the class six, seven, and eight kind of vehicle electrification. And how does that mean to the grid? So that's on the physics side. Um, I'm gonna also walk you through some of the research that we're doing on the market side, primarily focusing on understanding the human side of the behavior. So we all know one of the toughest cookies when it comes to engaging demand side flexibility is your home and my home. Because in the United States, the residential customers is consuming about one third of the total electricity in the country. And the retail customers most of you, including my house, are still paying fixed kind of a rate electric bills. Maybe a more advanced version is the two tiered pricing, peak time and off peak time, that's it. But California is changing the peak time from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. because of the solar. Uh, how, how do you reflect that? How do you reflect in a real-time basis? <laughs> so we have been kind of doing quite a bit of work along this line called energy coupon which is a retail level uh, customer behavior experiment that we did over the past uh, seven years on trying to engage retail customers to participate into demand flexibility, but keeping your existing rate structure. So it's a carrot, not a stick. So the carrot here is a dynamically generated individual targeted coupon coupons. So this is the, actually the app that we developed. So this is the, uh, a lot of the <laughs> research is behind the scene, but what you see is this. This is the blue is your, your baseline consumption. And then if you go down to the yellow zone, you get three coupons. You go to the green zone, you get, uh, sorry, two coupons. And you go to the green zone, you get five coupons. And you might ask why coupon, why not direct money? Because it turns out that on a per kilowatt basis, the monetary saving you would have contributed to the utilities is very minuscule, 50 cents here and 20 cents there. If I give you 50 cents to change your behavior of your home appliances, you might say, sorry, I'm busy doing my homework. I don't have time, right? So how do you elevate that? There's actually this Nobel winning idea called the prospect theory, which says that if I give you $1 versus if I give you a, a coupon, or a, a lottery ticket, which has a 0 0.01 chance of winning $10,000, which one would you take? It turns out that human beings, when it comes to small expected payoff, we are a lot more risk taking than risk neutral. So by just doing this one little thing, plus the dynamic target of real-time supply demand situation, uh, we want to test out this hypothesis that can we more effectively engage residential customers through these kind of a coupons, right? So there's a whole bunch of research behind it. Uh, a group of researchers spend a lot of efforts and there's actually even a stream of technology on this. At the end of the day, what we are able to find is that yes, uh, this approach is very effective for targeting the active customers in reducing their peak time energy consumption compared to the state of the art technology at the time which was actually, there was a beautiful study by Professor Frank Wallach at the, the business school here, um, who have done a very nice study on understanding the behavior of uh, critical peak pricing in Southern California. So what they found out is that in order to get equivalent of one kilowatt hour of reduction, the utility have to spend about 3.6 times of your retail rate to entice that customer to change their behavior. Whereas using this coupon dynamic target and real-time information, we were able to show that this approach could have changed the per kilowatt hour cost of engaging the customer for the utilities by almost seven times to about half of your retail rate, right? So we did that, I mean, a lot of work. We have to literally like knock at people's door and get these experiments done in Houston area, but it was very hard. At the end of the day, five years later, we collected 550 customers. 
I mean, we were happy to publish a paper about this 50 customer, but then this uh, Gates Venture, the, the Breakthrough Energy people came to us and said, okay, can you do it for the whole United States? How many people do we have in the United States? 300 million. It took us five years to do 50 experiments. How in the world can I do 300 million customer experiments? No way, right? So what do we do? We got stuck again. Again, we are turning our help for uh, generative AI. So we said, okay, how about maybe we can utilize some of these ideas uh, from Houston area, try to understand this sort of a, uh, a distribution shift from, you know, the behavior, because, because the customer in Houston is not going to be the same as customer in San Francisco, right? So we try to understand that through characterizing the distribution drift and using this uh, conditional variation autoencoder, which is basically a different version of a conditional GAN. Some of you may have used conditional GANs to actually scale it up. And uh, we are pleased to report that we actually deliver this uh, demand response uh, data set to Breakthrough Energy, which is now available for everybody to use uh, for, for the state of Texas. So, so that is uh, not 50 anymore, but millions of customers on, the, on that scale. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting learning experience of going from the real world experiments and then scale it up to a much larger through the power of generative AI, right? Um, we're also doing a lot of other interesting work on the market. This is something we have just begun in the summer, but I think it's going to be potentially quite game changing. You know, Texas and I think California the same way, it, you really, we are really getting through a tough problem, which is we need to build a lot more transmission lines to connect all these renewables to the demand centers. But building a transmission line in this country is a 10 year exercise, if not longer. So what do we do between now and the next 10 years? So we have been kind of uh, playing with this idea of thinking about not only from the hardware sense, but also from an operating sense of changing from this sort of a peak time scheduling philosophy into something about average uh, power scheduling by sticking properly, strategically, pairs of energy storage on some of the congested lines across the network. The end result is that you will be able to effectively reduce the need for build a lot more transmission line while increasing the network throughput significantly. And we all know, thanks to experts like Professor Sui, the energy storage cost is going down like this. So the business value is getting there quite significantly. We're also understanding big time on the crypto mining's impact on the grid. Uh, the White House recently re released a report about the carbon footprint of crypto mining. Texas is now 25% uh, of the US crypto mining and about 10% of the global crypto mining just in one state. So it's a, about two gigawatt of a crypto mining now in Texas. Two gigawatt is a no small number anymore. So uh, what exactly is their impact on the reliability, on the carbon footprint, and on the electricity market price. The key takeaway message is that it turns out that location matters a lot. And that is in direct contrast to what the, uh, the, the White House report was reporting. So there's a lot of detail on, on high resolution data that is needed to categorize that. Uh, also some new ways of constructing market clearing mechanism without the prior knowledge of the uncertainty distribution uh, we have also done quite a bit of work on the so-called scenario approach, which give you a risk knob, if you wish, for the ISO, the independent system operators, to design the market clearing mechanism as, the, as they see properly. And uh, we have also done a sort of a, we kind of took an inspiration from, you know, open, open AI gym. So we created open grid gym. So those of you who are Python savvy and AI savvy must have played with open AI gym for reinforcement learning course project or research topics, right? So how do we kind of uh, introduce the state of the art reinforcement learning algorithms into the side of demand and distribution systems uh, and lower the barrier of entry for a lot of the machine learning experts into the power market. So we create this bridge called Open Grid Gym, which allows uh, state of the art RL or 
or AI methods to be readily integrated with uh, software such as OpenDSS. Those of you who are in power systems knows OpenDSS. So that's on the market side. I'm gonna talk just a few minutes about a very important topic, which I think uh, we actually have been doing quite a bit on, which is on the flip side, the flip side of the all the cool things that digitization has to offer. And that is the cyber physical uh, security. Uh, the large California now has more than a million solar panels. Every solar panel is equipped with something called a smart inverters, right? What does smart inverter do? Smart inverter give you the capability of maximizing the sun power to the grid and also allows you to remotely control and monitor what's going on on the, on the panel. So how do you make sure that smart inverter does not fall under the hands of somebody malicious? Would these smart inverters be introducing some of this false oscillation behavior like what we discussed earlier? I don't know. So collaboration with uh, some colleagues uh, at uh, a and we're doing quite a bit of work. Uh, we have a, actually a fairly large DOE project on this topic of uh, defending, cyber defending all the solar panels in the future distribution grids. And the idea is through something called dynamic watermark. So dynamic watermarking, as you know, if you take a hundred dollar bill, you everybody here has a hundred dollar bill. Not really anymore. But you look under the, the light, you see something embedded in the in the money, right? That's called the watermark. What is a watermark? It is something that's not very easily delible. It's indelible, and it can differentiate authentic money from the fake money, right? Here. The power grid is not a static system. It's a dynamically evolving system. So we are introducing dynamic watermarking. So the key idea is that you do the regular control as you would have anyway done on the solar inverter. But on top of that control, you add a minuscule level random signal, very small random signal. But that random signal is going to propagate the entire network coming back to the sensors observing something we engineers all know about called transfer functions, right? Which is a dynamic input-output relationship between what is entering here and what you're receiving on the sensor end. And then we have worked out the theory. This is the simple example of sync, the uh, single input, single output system. But the key idea is that it turns out this is actually a necessary and sufficient condition for authenticating these kinds of attack by doing these two um, tests. In theory, you have to do it in a, uh, in a limit operation, but in practice, you can do it on a moving window horizons. So that's this uh, uh, $6 million project that we are in the midst of doing, uh, trying to do that. And uh, I guess instead of uh, walking you through, I'll just play a video. To there is a dangerous cyber vulnerability to our national electrical grid network. To solve this, we have been working on this important problem to find realistic solutions. Algorithm development for cyber attack detection from Texas A&M, corrective control development from MIT, computational algorithm development from Argonne National Lab, and validation in the lab, actual microgrid testing from IIT and Texas A&M. Then we successfully detect potential cyber attack scenarios through our proposed solution. We are implementing this general purpose cyber attack defense methodology to Centerpoint Solar Farm this year. They are located in Evansville, Indiana. One is called Oak Hill Solar Farm, and the other one is called Volkman Solar Farm. We pioneered a real-time secure monitoring system for detecting attacks called dynamic watermarking. Here's how it works. Solar panels generate electricity, which is stabilized and inverted, then supplied to the grid. The sensor measurements communicate with the controller through the network, which is vulnerable to attacks. That's why we inject our dynamic watermarking signal into the system. Our software continuously monitors system behavior. Once an attack is detected, an alert is instantly sent to an operator. Our team brings expertise in the fields of power electronics, power systems, and cyber physical systems.
So this is on the on the cyber physical side. So um, I guess I'll just try to wrap up things. Um, I guess I spend a lot of time talking about various different aspects, but if you were to stop and think about what we talk about, I think grid is a, a critical vehicle for getting us to the decarbonization. And when you are working on the grid problem, you have challenges on the physics side. You have challenges on the market side. You have challenges in large scale modeling side. And all of them are absolutely fantastic problems to work on uh, scientifically, and having a major societal impact. So we have been also doing a bit of a societal impact through you know, policy outreach. Uh, we wrote this article uh, actually before, if you look at the date, we published a Jew article, but also we had a companion piece on the Hill. Uh, it was a predated the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure package, because we felt that it was very, very important to study these issues. Uh, we are being requested by, by the Public Utility Commission of Texas. So the new chairwoman, her name is Kathleen. She's very worried about Texas not having enough of supply for the next summer. So she's asking us to study the, the energy efficiencies. What in the world can we do in the next six months to 12 months to get Texas through another major extreme weather situations? So we're working very closely with ERCOT and with the chairwoman's office to get this done. On the blockchain side, we just organized this workshop uh, bringing together the world's largest Bitcoin miner, uh, such as Riot, and uh, the system operator. So AG is the one who is speaking. He is the head of the large flexible demand uh, task force at ERCOT. And uh, uh, Priority Power is one of the largest uh, suppliers of schedulers, the qualified scheduling entity for, for this uh, large demand. So trying to bring these different groups together, talk about the technical issues at the state level. At the, country, at the federal level, Ram actually came down to visit us uh, in April, uh, together with some uh, other friends uh, around the country. Uh, we are actually working with National Science Foundation to define what is important on carbon neutral electricity and mobility, and hopefully some good uh, funding will come out of this area. And uh, we're also helping the DOE's uh, Solar Energy Technology Office in the two weeks, three weeks time to, to, organ to, to define some of the research agenda on solar power AI uh, at, uh, at DOE. And uh, we also done quite a bit of a just public service to, to do a lot of uh, media in interactions on, on issues surrounding the grid. So I guess I'll stop here. I'll just say that you know, this is a fascinating area of, of research. And the fact that you are here, you know, is a great testament that uh, uh, the electric grid is a very, very centerpiece of the decarbonization and sustainability effort that many of you are pioneering for. So I, uh, I applaud your efforts in, in pushing this agenda together. Thank you. So VPB is a fairly um, loosely defined terms. So I suspect what you mean by VPB is the capability that you can coordinate a group of uh, responsive demand to be dispatched. Right? That's the ultimate goal. Is that we would like this uh, VM to be behaving like VDP. So think about if you are VDP operator, you receive a dispatch signal from California ISO, okay, reduce five megawatts. Now you work out your formula to disaggregate to the customer one, two, three, four, five, ten. So you should discuss reduce this part in such. How do you get that done? You have two ways. One is I directly control them. So some people don't like to reach back to control. So this is another one. They give you coupon. So hopefully I can entice you to the right product. So the way of achieving the okay.
So I want to share with you a story about that. We were doing this experiment in a neighborhood in Houston called Cyprus, you know, the country, there. there's a neighborhood called Cyprus. And we, just, we just blindly knock at people's door and get them in the cage. At the end of the day, when we studied this, we found out some very strange behavior, which is totally I have never identified. It, it turns out that you, you saw that we have an active group and inactive group type. And then looking at the active group, which are the ones who are actively participating in the experiment, it turns out that their, their social economic status, they are not necessarily the poorest people on the street. They do share one thing in common. They are mostly uh, immigrants and mostly uh, Indian and Chinese doctors. And uh, uh, because that neighborhood has a lot of uh, Asian immigrants, and they are not like, they are usually middle upper class kind of. Because this immigrant mentality, even though they might be making half a million income, they will still try to get this uh, $5, $10 worth of coupon. So, so I guess that's my long answer to the question uh, of uh, on the equity side. We did not design that at the front, but we did realize there is some social economic aspect. Of it. Yes. Uh, are the alterations in the liquid grids uh, related to the intermittence of the mobile energy of wind and solar, or what exactly might be like the physical so the physical cost is a combination of intermittent, but not the kind of intermittent we have in mind. It's more of intermittent that is much faster. So you, uh, everybody here is an engineer, right? So you know something called the Fourier analysis, right? So you take a wind power or solar power output, you run a Fourier analysis, what do you get out of it? You get a frequency spectrum, right? So what you see on the frequency spectrum is that the intermittence or the variation is across the board. Both in the minute time scale that we are talking about, and also in the millisecond time scale that people typically don't observe. So that's one. But more fundamental issue actually has to do with this controller tuning. So all these controllers, every single wind farm, every single solar farm has a power electronics converter. And they are all controlled. And they are all tuned according to your local behavior requirement. It's like sometimes the left hand is fighting with the right hand, and that's the, the cause of this uh, force population behavior. It's a very interesting problem, yes? I have a question about the market structure. So you mentioned that the market doesn't play a role in the students that they are interested. There's different markets that can play a role in the students that are interested. And the quantum is that the key in it is the system. Is it still on others? I think uh, the market design is fundamentally integrated with availability of uh, of digitization. I'll give you a concrete example. Texas this Monday has just issued a new request for proposal for three thousand megawatts of capacity for this upcoming winter. And in the proposal, they request three things that can be qualified dispatchable generation, demand response, and energy storage. Coming back to your notion about DPP, if you can have in the right kind of digitization that can really engage the demand response in the right way, then you can actually make money on it. You should go ahead and do it in Texas because they're actually right now requesting 3,000 megawatts of such a so I would say the market has a direct relationship with the digitization capability. That's just the one concrete example. Yes. Yeah. 
a great question, because we are still exploring the potential use case of this generated data. But I think I firmly believe there's a lot of need for such generated data. One of the direct use cases that we have used so far is for training the fault classification algorithm. So I'll give you an example. I have a student who used to work for Korean uh, Tekto, the Korean Electric Power Corporation. And they used the drones to fly around to take images of the poles, electric poles, and look at their insulators if they have failed or not failed. So you go out, take pictures, look at this, uh, this uh, insulator failing or not failing. I mean, well, you say, how, how do you know it's failed or not failing, right? They use human intelligence. Right? This uh, 30 year experienced power engineer sitting there, oh, this is a failure, this is not a failure. And then, how, how, how much can you scale up on that, right? And you develop some uh, AI or whatever cool algorithm to say, oh, I can detect this for you, separate the 40 ones and non 40 ones. But then you say, okay, how many data samples do you have? 300 data samples over here? Is that enough? No, sorry, that's not enough. So, one of the direct use for this generative approach is that we generate a whole bunch of this thing said 40 images. And then I feed that to that uh, AI algorithm to do the classification. And we have a paper that to be presented there, I think, next week at the NAS 2017. Thank you.